How are you all doing? I'd like to welcome you to the Pitt County Board of Directors of Department of uh, Social Services. At this time, we'd like to observe a moment of silent prayer or silent meditation. Okay. I'd like to ask, is there any um, additions uh, to uh, today's agenda? No, there's no. Oh. I move that we accept agenda as printed. Okay. Second. Okay. okay, we'll have a motion on the floor, and that's been seconded to accept today's agenda. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone if there's any um, changes to last week's uh, minutes. I, I have one okay. uh, at the very back of it. I think today is not August 10th. It's August the 13th. It's the next yeah. meeting. Yes. So we, we need to have our minutes correct. Okay. It's the very last page, page four of the minutes. Page four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, director's report. Okay. I move that I have a correction that the minutes be approved as mail. And I second it, Mr. James. Okay. Motion has been made and accepted. Now we're going to move on to the uh, status of the uh, agency personnel. We have been making some progress in the filling of our vacant positions. Since the last time we met, we have filled four positions through internal promotion as well as bringing individuals in from outside of the agency. At the present time, we have ten positions frozen, eight that we are uh, advertising for doing and five we're waiting on background checks and four that we're interviewing well, so we're making progress hopefully next month you will see the majority of those and field positions okay. um, I was counting through uh, uh, the list here and between advertising interviewing and background check uh, I counted um, 21 positions is that correct let me see, we got four that we're interviewing for, uh -huh. eight that we're advertising for, the eight and four is 12, and five are waiting background checks, so that would be 17, and four that we feel, so that's 21. Okay, and we're looking to fill these by? We're looking to have those positions filled by the, in between here and next month. So okay. Mr. Avery has already done the majority of the interviewing, waiting on the background checks, references, so we can move forward with offering those individuals a okay. job. Uh, most I of have, yeah. I have, I have one question. Uh, I noticed on page seven, uh, social workers three position, I, it brought curiosity to my mind. The second social worker three, is that something that this uh, board uh, look into, or look at, or inquire about? We have uh, two of the social worker three positions are in foster care. We have one social work three position that is in adult services, the one in adult services. That's the three it's months? A, that's the one I'm talking about. That's the the three months the, is the social worker three in foster care. That and has the actually reason, been longer than three months. We might need to me. talk about that. That's it's been longer than three months. It's been longer than three months. In close session. No, I was okay. talking about right here with sure. the, with the uh, status. Yeah. Right. Okay. Those are the ones that froze. Out of, I yeah, sure. Out of the 21 that you said that we are now in the process of hiring, all right, how many of those are you going to have to train? Or how many of them have already received the training, uh, graduates of East Carolina or some other area? Ryan, I, can, I can speak to the ones, the eight that I'm working with. Um, in the food and nutrition services area, five uh, of the five, one has ex many years of experience in food and nutrition services and the other four will require training. Of the other three positions that we're filling, uh, two are, would be uh, internal applicants that would already have program experience in that area and the other one 
would be uh, I already have training coming in from the outside. So out of out of the eight positions, four would require program training and four would already have training. So about 50 percent already have the training and 50 percent would need training. Is that about the way it is with all of them, approximately half then out of the 21? The one and the two in the services division that we've recently hired will have to go through pre-service That is training. a requirement. <clears throat> that's, a, by, that's by statute. Yeah. And these are all people, or residents of this county, prior to hiring or bringing in, coming in? Just curious. If some are residents, some live in another county. Okay. Mr. Mayor? How many of these? roughly of the 21 might be filled and Brian I think you might have just answered that but might be filled by people I guess what you might say being either transferred or promoted into it uh, um, of the eight that we <coughs> filled um, four three of them are internal and five are being hired from the outside but the ones that are promotions or uh, the higher level case work where people will be people promoted from inside that's the way it's going to work out and already have they're with us and they already have training in their program area but i i'm working with eight of that 21 right now and then the others on the list that are income maintenance that we're advertising we receive <coughs> some and, and are interviewing we receive the applications but we have finished interviewing for eight of the positions in my area my asking that question was based on if it is promotions then it leaves a correct. vacancy right. that has That's to turn correct. around right. and be refilled. That's right. I have two questions there. When a person moves up, is that position then automatically open or do we it's go frozen. back to the county? It is frozen, it put is on the list and the county manager will go through the process of reopening up that position for us to advertise. So when you see the priority list, that's why we got those positions frozen. Ms. Florida Hardy meets with the county manager each Monday and go through the frozen list and alerts us to as to how many positions we are able to uh, advertise for. How, how long, first my question was the number of that 21, are there five, six that would be promoted up? And if so, what would be the average time to get that filled in all the departments? Two months, three months? I would say it would depend on when the county manager released that position to be advertised. If he sticks to it and allows us to do it every other week, then it probably would take about a month or two to fill that position. Because if we uh, go outside, we advertise at least a week or so. And then once the advertise once the uh, applications come in, then the Human Resource Department goes through the process of seeing whether or not those individuals qualify for the position. And then once they do the screening, then they send them around to us. And then we have to go through the process as well. And then we pick the ones that we want to interview. The last time for one position, we had over 100 some applicants for that position. Then you got to go through those to pick the ones that you want to interview for that position. All right, out of that 21 that you're hiring now, how many did the county say that they would let you rehire or to fill oh, the positions? Those are 21 that he has given us permission. So to. that's all, that would be all that you uh, have. And to fill these other positions that are going to come open that has been suggested here could take longer then. It could take longer. Uh, he could release two or three right every other week. Hand. Okay. You know, so it's just a matter of when the county manager say, okay, you have two that you can. But it sounds like an automatic freezing process. Yeah, what, mm -hmm. but what I'm interested in is now, how many, and he, you know how many you think yeah. he, he's going to let you hire for the coming year, like the 21. How many additional ones do you think the county can afford? You to I think the county can afford all the positions. All of how many today? We got at the present time we have 27 vacant positions, and we have 10 that's frozen. So I think he, I think we'll follow Take a bunch and everything. Okay, that'd be good. Then. The, you know, <laughs> what is happening for promotions when you hire in house, it creates another vacancy. Oh, so. Yeah. We want to promote within-house, but when yep. you promote in-house, 
it takes a while because you fill that pos position, then you create another vacant position in the position that the person just left. So that position goes on the vacancy report as being frozen until the county manager releases that. I, I, I still like re -innovating. Internal promotions are always good. I, I support internal uh, promotions. I feel very strong about internal promotions. And because it keeps the morale high and it gives people good motivation to do a good job for you. That's the way I look at it. But uh, to go on an automatic freeze is sound what I'm, what I'm hearing concerns. And that's something that the community need to okay. be concerned about as it relates with county managers automatically freezing and then releasing as right. fit. And that doesn't mean that we don't want to provide a good service. It means that the county is deciding that we can sit tight on whatever. And, and that's not good for the community. And I just wanted to say okay. that. Because one thing I was looking at, <clears throat> as, as you asked about, of that 21, how many are new, hi or new hires versus mm -hmm. those yeah. that are going to be moving up? And so what we're going to be doing, we're going to be in a kind of a difficult situation in a sense that we're going to be training new people and then we're going to have vacancies from those internal people that um, got promoted. So there's going to be a little bit of a, a, a lag time there in terms of what we uh, might be able to do and to keep the workflow going. One thing good about this report not only does it tell that it was vacant, it tells how long the position stayed vacant. And that's what I looked at for a period of time. When you have someone waiting for 60, and we have a large body of senior mm -hmm. citizens here, and you got 60, that's more than a year, 16 months of a vacant position. That means service is slack. And that means that the staff is overworked and stressed. So uh, that's something that uh, if somewhere or another somebody can look into it and find out about it, the community needs to raise the issue on it. Charlie, I think you had a question. Early on, my question <clears throat> simply was when we have variable, and I agree with the promotions in house. In no way am I against that. I think it does offer opportunity where the people are trained and have the skills uh, or can get the skills. Uh, my question was, what is the average of how long it is taking once the county releases that? Because that's a factor that they would want to know as well as we want to know. Uh, when you say, when you, George, when you tell us that, well, it's whenever they do, we understand that. But what is the average? And have you asked them, do you expect to give two, three per setting or per review per month? or do you expect to fill all of these and it'll just be when we can do it during this year? And all that time frame yeah. that it takes to get somebody in tells you how big, if we say we got 21 spots and I'm just picking yeah. figures, we, we only filled <clears throat> 12 of them because eight of them came from within. Well, then we really didn't have, we really didn't gain 21 spots. So far as the public and the service rendered, we gained that, so hence, my question, how long should it take to fill that second wave? I would that say second. from the time that the county manager released it, he released the 21 position July the 1st. So what we're dealing with the first wave of the 21 position that were, were reduced, that were frozen, unfrozen July the 1st. So you can see that from July the 1st we have filled Four positions since our last board meeting. I think last month we had a few that we filled as well. I don't know how what it was last month. So we have made some progress in the last two months filling those positions. But from the date that the position become available to advertise, then we move. It has to be done on the Tuesday to get to the newspaper. So we got those time factors involved in getting it to the newspaper. And then once it goes to the newspaper, it stays there for five days before we get those applications coming in. And once the applications come in, then HR has to go through the process of screening, saying that these positions 
are <coughs> approved and we feel that these people qualify for the position. So you can look at anywhere from 10 to 15 days before we even get the first list of people that we can look at. That you pull out. Pull out. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Perry, I yes. thought about it. All right, the city county is going to release 21 employees. That you can so go on how to 21 and put them to work if you've got a job for them to do. Then do your promotion, and then you won't, you don't lose it, the personnel. It doesn't work that way because you have to have a position to put someone into. Well, I, th I thought you were that many short, so you wouldn't but have those positions. We got those 21 positions, but people have to apply for those positions. And we don't just say, okay, we're going to move you. You have to apply, just like anyone from the outside, you have to apply for that position. Mm -hmm. And then you have to be interviewed for that position. So it's the same process right. internally. Yeah. I thought in terms okay. See, some positions internal promotions, you can just move up. I, I think what we're not seeing is the fact that you do you have the authority to internally promote? Yes. Yeah, we can we can either advertise our and then position advertise internally. The lower part, we can advertise our position internally, which means just for Pitt County DSS employers. Mm -hmm. Or we can advertise for Pitt County total, or we can go outside and for some positions like lead workers, supervisors, we advertise those internally among Pitt County DSS employees. And then for the other positions, then we go outside. We just make those a general thing for anyone within that can apply for those positions. But for supervisory positions and lead worker positions, we try to go in-house first and just do an internal recruitment. One of the things that I'm hearing that might help us out is that if we kind of had, if you can make an addition to the report, and, I'm, and this is the report we've been using for yeah. a while, but given the way things are, maybe what we'd like on, on this report additionally is the, the average time frame I think you were talking about uh, to fill a, you know, a position, those kinds of things. As, as well as um, uh, the time frame that we might be talking about. Um, as, as well as, I, I think the other thing is uh, in terms of maybe uh, pleading our case to the county manager, if there's a way to get these uh, positions released quicker so we don't have to wait as long, um, is there something that we can do to, to help out with that? Because the community uh, is the one that's getting the short end of the stick. Okay. Is there a way we can, can help oh, out that? Just anything? contacting the county manager, make him aware of your concerns. Have him look at our meeting. <laughs> make him aware of your concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Miss Florida Hardy is aware of our concerns. Because when you go to Social <laughs> Service Board on a Monday, and to, it's like a rat race down there. I won't call it much more than that, uh, uh, and I won't call it a zoo, but it's a lot of people, and people have stress and, and, and a lot of concern at that your staff has got to yeah. deal with when they come in off the street. And, and I'm really, you know, very glad that we've gotten this many, because from what I recall, with this number, this is the largest number of of people yeah. coming on board in in some time, right. from what I recall, so that that is we thank him, but yeah, yeah that is we're very, very fortunate. Very, 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 very you better be very thankful. We we thank him, but still, <laughs> that doesn't help the community mm -hmm. to, no, to still to lose services. You know, last year we were in the position that all the positions was frozen. So when we were coming, we were coming with thirty one <laughs> positions frozen and no outlook for filling anything. So in some respects, we are making progress, yeah, but maybe yeah. not as fast as we would like. That's sure, right. sure. Because I, from what I recall, when I was adding these up, I'm thinking like, we're getting 21 new people. I'm thinking like, wait a minute, we're moving people around and, and kind of seeing that we're making progress. And as um, you're bringing up with the internal uh, promotions, in a sense, we lose a position and then we got to move up and then there are training issues. And certainly with the way things are now, we really have to be 
cognizant of, of these um, changes. So that's that's really good. And, okay. And if you can add those things on to the next month's report. Yes, I got it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to move on here. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, a new uh, board member, uh, Rebecca Starkey. Okay. And Rebecca, would just just say a, a, a line or two about yourself? Well, my heart is in Pitt County, always has been in Pitt County. I mm -hmm. worked here uh, as a social worker for 31 years, mm -hmm. have maintained, retired in 2003, mm -hmm. have maintained contact with the agency in various ways. This is where my heart is, and if I, I'd consider it a total privilege to be invited to be a part of this board, and I hope that I can help. I hope that we can see some positive movement. And I uh, thank everybody for having me on the board, including those of you at Social Services who were so supportive. Okay, and the uh, we have the clerk here to do the uh, swearing in. And I, I want to say I'm really glad to have you here, have somebody with your expertise that will help us out. So I'm really uh, glad that you've been able to come back on, come on the board and be reunited, reunited with your heart. So am I, and I thank you. Okay. <clears throat> may we proceed? Uh, yes, you may. I guess that makes her official now. Makes, makes her, her official. official. And now she has the, all the rights and privileges thereof. say what I mean and mean what to say, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there is a trial period. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on now to the uh, budget uh, amendment, and that will be uh, presented by Peggy Quinn. Yes, sir. We received uh, $429,824 increase in our um, daycare funding for daycare services for the year, and we also received an increase of 12000 $201 for our home community care block grant in home aid services for the new fiscal year. Well, that's always good that we're getting money, and I know everybody would like that. Uh, I'd like to have a motion to accept the uh, money. I second that. Motion's been made and seconded, uh, and we will accept the money. Thank you very much Thank for that. <laughs> Uh, next, we're going to move on to the uh, um, SOAR. Excuse me. We need to vote on all motions. Oh, I thought we had. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. All right, we had the motion and yeah. we have a second. Okay. So I guess it would Cold be all question. in favor. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Okay, thank you for that. And opposed. Any opposed? Okay. Didn't think anybody would be opposed to free money. <laughs> okay, now we're going to uh, have a report from the uh, SOAR program. 
Um, thank you so much for um, asking me to come. My name is Paulette White. I'm the project manager for the 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness here in Pitt County. And um, three years ago, uh, partnership with the Department of Social Services, we began a program in Pitt County called SOAR. And I'm going to give you a little bit of information about SOAR and then give you some updates about how that program is going. So what SOAR stands for is SSI, SSDI, Outreach, Access, and Recovery. And um, the purpose of our SOAR program here in Pitt County is to access disability benefits for currently homeless people, individuals and families. And so that's where this program really concentrates on. We identify people who are homeless in our community who have a disability and then we have specially trained caseworkers who work with those homeless individuals to help them make that application. And our goal is to um, to increase the number of applications that we submit and to also uh, decrease the average time that it takes between submittal and um, an initial determination on that application. And, and I didn't put it in here, but the other goal we have is to increase the number of successful applications. But um, uh, so, so um, I wanted you to know too a little bit more about SOAR. It's really a national program that was developed from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it, it started about 10 years ago uh, in Philadelphia and has grown and, and, and um, uh, moved out into all of the states. Um, and this is just a map of the state of North Carolina that shows where the active areas are in North Carolina that actually have SOAR caseworkers. And I hope that you see that Pitt County is one of those counties that has an active SOAR program. Um, we have four trained caseworkers, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more with you. But just so that you, you can see that, that Pitt County is really um, participating and, and actually um, has considered a leader in the state of North Carolina in doing a program like this in a rural community. Um, just last month I was invited to uh, to give a presentation about our SOAR program at a national conference in DC um, uh, and, and it was received very well there so I, I just want to applaud Pitt County for uh, having the initiative. Okay, let's go. Are we gonna <laughs> uh, okay, how do we get this to move? Sorry. Did I do something? Oh, there it is. Maybe just, there it goes. Okay, thank you. I must have hit something. <clears throat> So in Pitt County, what we did, because we didn't have any dedicated funds to do a SOAR program, we said, how can we create partnerships in the community so we can get this going without having to expend enormous amounts of money? And so we have a partnership with uh, Pitt County um, Social Services, the City of Greenville, Vidant Medical Center, the Social Security Administration, the North Carolina Coalition to End Homelessness. They're the, uh, the statewide organization that helps keep us organized. 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness and Pitt County government. So it's really a collaborative effort between many, many, many groups in, North, in Pitt County to be able to uh, have this program available. So I, I did explain just a little bit. In, in Pitt County, we have a SOAR team that's made up of um, trained SOAR caseworkers. We have three in the Department of Social Services and one under the 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness. And they, they interact with different groups of people. Um, our SOAR caseworkers, <clears throat> to actually be able to um, do this process, go through two days of training that's held by the uh, North Carolina Coalition to End Homelessness. And that, that two days of training is very intensive. It, it, helps the caseworkers understand just what um, a disability application is, how that process works, what happens to your application when it goes in. And the, the other part of it is that they have to develop um, a really strong relationship with, our, with their client, with the homeless individual. And they also have to gather as much medical and other information to support the claim, the disability claim. So in Pitt County, in the, in the Social Security office, there are three adult at risk social, social workers who have been trained and are actively working on um, 
um, applications from time to time. Th those caseworkers get referrals specifically from the hospital. So there are people in the hospital that identify a homeless individual who has a disability and then co connects with the Department of Social Services for one of those caseworkers. They then do an eligibility screening to make sure that this person is actually eligible for the program, that they are homeless and that they have a disability that would rise to the level of, of submitting an application. The same is true for our 10-year plan caseworker. Um, she, she actually concentrates on working with people who are on the street or in the shelters. And we do have people who live on the street in Pitt County, just so you know, who are homeless. Um, she's, it's a little bit more challenging for her um, in the sense that when you deal with people who are literally homeless living on the street, it's very hard to get in touch with them. And sometimes they move around, and so it can take a little bit longer for her to actually get through that process. Um, but she does maintain office space in, um, at the Greenville Community Shelter so that she can help. We talked about a little bit about the application process. It takes some, somewhere between 30 and 40 hours to do a complete um, application using the SOAR method. And, and the, I put 1696, if you're not familiar with um, an application, one of, the, one of the key parts of a, a SOAR application is that caseworker becomes the representative at the Social Security office for that client. And again, when you're working with people who are homeless, you, you lose contact with them. The Social Security office can lose contact with them. They don't have an address to mail any information to them. So having a 1696 representative means that that information can get to the client. The, those caseworkers will pick up the client, take them to whatever office visits or appointments they have. And they can also talk to the Social Security office about where the application is, what, what process they're going through. The other key part about a SOAR, um, uh, a SOAR application is what we call um, this detailed medical summary report. SOAR <coughs> caseworkers collect as much information, medical and otherwise, on these clients. Um, I had um, worked with, we were working with one client where we had to go all the way back to elementary school records so that we can we could we could show the line, the history line of that person and how what what their mental state did while they were in school, in elementary school. So that is, that is why it takes so long to do these applications. The other thing that they do when they gather that information is, is they write a summary report. They take all that medical and otherwise information and, and create a narrative so that the person at Social Security who's reviewing that record can get a, a good understanding of who that person is, what their disability is, and what what that disability has done in terms of their ability to function um, in a job or in life. And it, that is really probably the key part of um, those SOAR uh, uh, applications. The last part is, again, those SOAR applications, the medical summary, are actually submitted to the physician or the uh, medical professional, and they review that summary report and then sign off on it. So again, it's this, it's, and that can take a lot of legwork, where you're running around trying to get in touch with a doctor. Get, get, it, can be, it can be really time consuming, but it's key to being able to um, get a successful approval rates on, on our applications. We use the, for our referral, there, again, the, we have this national program that developed a screening tool that we use in Pitt County. Um, we also, again, we are identifying target groups, so um, we actually are talking, you know, in the shelter, uh, working with people. We have a couple of uh, nonprofit groups that actually minister to the people on the street, so that's another way we get referrals so that these individuals groups know who we're trying to target with this program and that's where um, we're able to get some pretty good um, referrals. So again because we participate with the state we um, also get to see um, that they help us with our results and I think that we included this in your packet but I just want to show you again when um, uh, we talk about usable um, outcomes every uh, SOAR application that we do, our caseworkers complete an outcome report, and that outcome report is, is, is submitted to the state, and then they actually help us figure out our numbers. So um, we've had 51 outcome reports submitted 
um, to the state. We've got a, uh, we've had 27 of those um, applications that we've done have been approved. We've had 23 denied. It takes 76 days for us to get an initial determination. And the people that we work with on average are homeless from one, one, one year to 10 months. And when we say homeless, we mean that they are literally homeless. They are not living in, on someone's couch. They are, they're either on the street or they're um, in a shelter but we, we consider those folks to be literally homeless. Our approval rate is a little low, but I think one of the things that we've tried to do is, um, is, is make the program accessible. 54% um, is a little low. We'd like to see that more up with the state level, which is 80%, but we're, so we're working on our uh, referral process and how we're screening people. But the other important number when you look at this and you say we've gotten 27 applications approved, what that means is that's 27 people now have some income that they can use to keep themselves housed, buy food, pay their utility bills. All of those things are really important. And so that's the other thing that we track is um, how much income has come back to Pitt County because we have done this work. And so because those individuals are receiving um, disability um, it, it has meant over two hundred and forty two thousand dollars to the county in the two years that we've been that we've been doing this well three so one of the things that um, I, I wanted to just let you know about is what we're calling the next steps or lessons we've learned with this program I've talked a little bit about our referral process so we, we're in the process of reevaluating that referral process to make sure that we're connecting with our clients as early as possible um, one of the problems we've had is not getting a notice early enough and so they've been at the shelter long and then they there's a time limit that you can stay at the shelter it's 10 months and so if it takes us four months to get the approval it could take another couple of months to actually move the person into an apartment get them into the appropriate place so what we want to do is try to connect at an even earlier stage with our clients so that um, th that we'll, we can um, have better housing results um, we want to also uh, um, develop a, a slightly different outcome tracking so that we want to uh, we want to focus on what happens to the folks after they get their disability are they staying housed are they are they getting in, uh, into primary health care how are we how are we working through those processes with our clients and and that sort of rolls into the very last piece is that whole um, um, primary care we saw that as being a real problem as we were working on applications is having individuals with no income and they're homeless it's very difficult to get them into primary care and they cycle in and out of our emergency room so um, we submitted a grant to Vidant um, a foundation and they have just awarded the program five thousand dollars that we can use to um, establish primary medical care for our SOAR clients while, as they're going through that SOAR process so that will help with both medical dental and pharmaceuticals which is really an important piece for us um, so do you, are there any questions yes sir pays the four employees that you are hiring um the salary come from this the the social worker the so the caseworker that works under my umbrella we had a grant from uh, the city of greenville a cdbg grant and that pays her salary the department of social services just th this is just a uh, an additional um uh, quality piece that those caseworkers um provide in the instance that we've identified someone that they could work with that's one who pays the other three no the now three caseworkers at the department of social services so they're just doing that within their within so their the, role as as a social so worker the county pays that proportion in the yes. state of these who checks on them to make sure you said they're working out of the social security office no they, no 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 they no. work here mr james no. they work here yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, you said, I thought, well, I i'm here. sorry no. i did i know that i didn't make it real clear the, this is just um um they're uh, adult at risk caseworkers the three that i listed there are the uh, they're employees of pitt county and they do their they have their own job this is an additional thing that they can offer to um adults at risk who get referred to them all right so this is not a full-time job no 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 this no. is just a part-time it's job. not even a part-time job it's oh, just so a service that they're providing oh, well, 
Yeah, it's not. It's not because there's not. Well, you saw the number. There's not. There's not a need to have a full time well, person yeah, doing that. Time. Yeah, um, I do. The person that works under the ten year plan works probably um, one quarter. Tom, if, if that's what you want to want to think about it, yeah. she only works when she has a client to work with. Well, what part would the VA hospital? You know, a lot of these people are veterans. They say some of them are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what part would the when we get this uh, the, veteran hospital here? And I know that's going to be a great plus for right. people East North Carolina. Will that play a part in something like? talking about this it could um we already work real you know the va has a homeless counselor oh, yeah. here and and so she actually pitt county does actually have a program for homeless vets yeah. and so if there wasn't most veterans would be applying to the va for any kind of disability if it's if it's service related uh -huh. so if it's not service related they could they could refer them over to us if if we thought that it was appropriate to move forward with a sort with a with a disability with application yes mm -hmm. gotcha. yes ma'am sure. do uh. y'all choose the clients or do the clients request the service the clients request the service and we screen them to make sure that they are eligible for it some people have already put in an application they don't quite understand so we don't take people we don't take clients like that um, some clients, after you do an initial screening, they're not going to be good candidates for disability. So we say, well, you can move to a lawyer, but we're not going to we're not going to move forward with that application because we don't think that it would be successful. But yeah, who does that screening? Who do, the caseworkers? We use that um, national screening tool that from um, the SOAR in um, the state of North Carolina. Okay, I like Mr. James thought that you meant that there were two workers at Social Security. Oh, oh, That's no. what I so, so if you don't mind, explain that. Okay, I think about social worker. Yeah. Um, okay, there are five people. There, there are four caseworkers. There are four trained, sore trained caseworkers in Pitt County. Okay. They are not associated with a depart with a social security office at all. But are with DSS. Three are with DSS and one are with the ten year plan in the planning department. Okay. Where where is she located physically? Physically she's located at the community um, the Greenville Community Shelter. And that person is paid for a grant through the city of Green uh, Greenville City um, community block grant funds. Okay. And when the process is initiated, who continues to follow to maintain the goal satisfaction? For the program assess, or for the client? To assess the, that the goal has been achieved for each individual person. <clears throat> the caseworker, the person who's working on that application. Okay. Does, is it, does that make sense? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, um, one other question. Um, this medical grant, okay, how, what determines which of these people receive the medical or the dental help and how much of that grant, how much each one is entitled to? Um, we are working that process out right now. What um, if a client? The way we had we had addressed it with the, the grant was if we have taken on a sore client, there there are we're working on we're actively working on a social security application, and that person needs some type of medical follow up. We're we will we have worked it out with Bernstein Clinic that we can refer them to Bernstein Clinic. They can see them as a client. We'll pay the copays, which is twenty dollars a client we can get them enrolled in health assist which is another um, health care um, program in Pitt County that assists people who have no insurance to get specialized medical care if they need it so both of those things will be handled through those kind of is it possible that one of these people that some of these people would be eligible for Medicaid is that explored yes for it's explored um you know if you if you're approved for social security you automatically get medicaid, medicaid. 
yeah and so we we you know we, we we'll submit two applications but one for medicaid and one for the social security nine times out of ten they don't get approval for medicaid if if as we're going through that process so that's why we really wanted to have some funding that we could establish that primary care with because they are ill and and if you can't pay your co-pays you can't get your medicine how about disability for these people <coughs> you have that don't you all apply for disability yes. for them yes that's what we're doing and that's beyond the social services benefits i'm talking about like well many ways especially if they are vet if they're a vet yeah we submit both applications it's the way that the social security office makes that determination it could be ssi it could be ssdi it could be both we we submit an application for both but it just how they determine it is is based on what kind of medical problems the person has okay i think um Perkins, you had some yes uh you're talking about a, a total of 40 uh 50 51 50 total outcome reports total yeah outcome people and uh these 51 cases were looked at by people already on social service staff mm -hmm. and they are doing the paperwork uh they're doing the evaluation of the applications and they are writing the report of their findings right when they submit that application so this program how long this program has been in effect since two th we started in the fall of 2009 putting it together and probably submitted our first application in the early part of 2010 what's the average process of an app uh, the average amount of time is spent on an application because we it, have a staff that's a lot of vacancy and we seven to six days yeah it 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 takes somewhere between 20 to 30 20 to 40 hours to do an application um per per person depending on the level of medical um information that we have if it's if if you have someone who has a lot of medical information and a lot of um, medical uh, problems that are, are very easy to see, that's an easy application to do. The harder applications, and those are the ones that tend to go to the caseworker that works under me, are the ones with mental health issues, which make it much more difficult to actually do that application. You're, you're working with someone who doesn't, it's difficult when they're, when, it's difficult when you're working with someone who, who doesn't quite know where they are <laughs> and what they're doing. I I'm, don't want it to sound like this is a piece of cake. It, it, it just, there's some of the folks that we work with that are, are difficult. They don't quite understand what's happening to them. And so those are the ones that really make it much more difficult to do an application on. Uh, 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 personnel. Uh, you have a personnel uh, HR person. Yes. Have you received any kind of concerns, complaints, or interest as to workload of additional programs and things like that? It, she did an excellent job explaining the program. The, the whole package that she's presented is not in our package. But then I said, it sounds like a lot of work. What happened? We have. In the Department of Social Service, we have income maintenance caseworkers, which is an adult Medicaid, family, children Medicaid, food and nutritional service. These applications will fit under the adult Medicaid program, which means that the adult Medicaid worker will end up taking the application for Medicaid. But they would not go through the process of helping that client gather all that information. So that's where the social worker come involved in because they can take that client, help them to gather all that information that they need to process their case and make sure that it's everything that they need is submitted and go to the right place. So the case workers will take the application and tell the client what they need to process the application, but they will not 
brought that client through those processes to get that application. That's where the adult services social worker come involved in working with that client to gather the information, submit it. If we need to go to the doctor's office, they would do it. So we have two different workers working. Have with you case. received concerns? No, we have not. Complaints or uh, something from internal staff because we have a lot of vacancies and I was just interested no. in knowing. If you look at the numbers, there are small numbers when you look at. Yeah, we we're uh, looking over a two year, well, a two and a half year thing. Did, with the thing that we submitted, did you do the second page that shows, for instance, the caseworkers? So yeah. DSS has submitted approximately two thirds of the application, and the caseworker that works with me has submitted approximately one third of those applications. So th over the two and a half years we've been doing this, they've submitted about 40 applications. So you're talking about page 14, I think. I, I yes. think, yeah. Paula, yeah. and it might help to clarify that the social workers that are working that have been trained in SOAR are already working. They're in the services division. They're in the prevention unit. They're working with already with adults who are at risk, okay, yeah. already. What we've done is provide them with some more tools. Being SOAR certified is one of those tools because when, they're, when referrals come into this agency to work with an adult at risk of, of losing their home or a medical condition, this gives them an opportunity to have another tool because they've been trained in, in what that whole social security system looks like in terms of that whole disability process and they are trained in order to provide what is absolutely needed up front because we've learned a lot about that system and the average time it takes usually a person applying, what is two years? It's two Plus? to three years. And, and again, I think what you're, when, when you understand the process that the Social Security Office goes through, it, it's very complicated. Very complicated. And if you provide all of that good information up front and in a, in a fashion that the Social Security Office can use it, they can make a determination Quicker. quickly about whether this person really does rise to the level of that kind of disability. And so, um, and again, having that little bit of income can really make a difference in helping someone get well, housed or Well, and it's very difficult housed or prior to this and even today because this is, you know, we would love to grow this even further. You can imagine the resources that the social workers are trying to dig up every single day to help an adult stay in an apartment, buy medications, pay a utility bill. We no longer have general assistance funds. So getting income into their hands certainly um, lightens the load of our resources in terms of what's needed to sustain people with no income in this community. So, and, and I think that one of the nice things about the way, I mean, it's kind of a crazy structure in some, some respects, but, but because the DSS only takes referrals from the hospital, that really limits the number of applications that they really take. We're not, we don't have the capacity don't have the to capacity. grow it bigger than that right now. So, you know, it was a partnership with the hospital. It was certainly to look at, instead of having a homeless person in a bed for we days, weeks, and months, this was one of those solutions in our that we looked at in our 10-year plan to end homelessness that certainly uh, was a better use of our local resources than to keep somebody housed in a bed in the hospital um, that nobody was paying for. I also think that um, one of the <laughs> things that we tried to do when we put this together, and again, that I think that's one of the reasons why um, rural communities were looking at what Pitt County did is doing, is that first of all, by doing it, by actually get, getting out there and trying to do something. We've now got information about how to do this. We now have information on these individuals. We're going back now and looking at what kind of cost savings we, that the hospital received because we have done this service. So with that kind of information, we can now go back and, and find appropriate uh, places to apply for funding. Maybe we can apply for funding to get a full-time caseworker. But, but, but we have that data to show now. This is what we can do. Th we know this works. We know this is good for people. 
um, and these are the results. So we have something to be able to, to um, uh, And use. I think the hospitals, by giving, a, by giving us the $5,000 grant, certainly is supporting this effort that we're involved in. I've, I've been involved in mental health, a lot of us have, for many, many years. And we used to deal, you know, with it a great deal. Mm -hmm. And you haven't mentioned mental health. As to the, and the hospital, I know that they, I know what the hospital wants. They want money. <laughs> Face it. Well, and, but how, what part, and we're spending just Bukus of money in mental health. Mm -hmm. I get complaints about what they're doing and what it's costing us. What? How are they involved with you? It looks like to me you all ought to be working with them hand in hand to help these people out. That they and they are supposed right. to be working with them too, by the way. Well, and they are. Um, it, it's not as defined a partnership like we do like the list of folks that I do but every one of our clients we try to get them in if if mental illness is the issue we we have we try to get them into the appropriate mental health provider we do have the nonprofit the one nonprofit mental health provider who can who has been really good at seeing folks who don't who don't have any money yeah. Um, but yeah it can be a challenge but but the caseworker <clears throat> has to interact with that mental health provider, whoever it is, because they're providing the information that we're using on that application. They are getting a tremendous, you know, it's a tremendous amount of money to take and to serve these people. This is the reason that, like myself, I was so much against, you know, the, mm -hmm. the state taking over, because I thought we could do our business better. But I, I, I think we need to be working very closely on something like this with the mental health people because they've got the expertise now yeah. also to do this to, to ha help you handle these well, situations and i know we've got a lot of them yeah and, and you know um <coughs> east carolina behavioral health lme had just is hiring they are hiring two sore caseworkers but they will cover 19 counties so they're not they're not just for they're pitt not, county but yeah, they do recognize not. this is an important piece <laughs> for that in and they have established two, wow. two, well, two um, employees. I, I but know we could talk about this yeah. whole. Yeah. So you have, we're not going to stop this problem. <laughs> I knew that. You may have your hand up for a minute. Thank you. If I understand this, and when our case workers are working on it, it is not as though, and correct me if I understand it wrong, they're not just assigned to this. Our case workers are looking at this segment of society for any and all possibilities of resources and services for them. And this is just one added piece that some may qualify. Is that correct? Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I was looking at um, from the first slide and you had a uh, number of counties there, was that five counties that have the SOAR program, or was it? There are more counties more? that have the SOAR program. There's about mm -hmm. 19 counties, but 19. there, but the through the North Carolina Coalition, they were showing which counties had active SOAR uh, caseworkers, like we do. Um, um, I think Mecklenburg, uh, Wake County. There was one in the North Carolina. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah um, one at, um, Wilmington. Um, um, down, what is that? New Brunswick? Yeah. Orange County. Yeah. Orange <laughs> County. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What I was Bunkin impressed County. about, I mean, what I was looking at is that, so with 100 counties in um, the state, so there's only roughly only a fifth of those counties have active sore yes, caseworkers. Sore caseworkers, right. So that's, uh, so that's very good that we're one of those counties that are doing that because as I see homelessness, it, it's throughout the... Um, the state and, and I'm really glad that you're you're taking that on and I'm really glad that we're clarifying the kinds of things that um, the um, caseworkers are doing because we were looking at um, a total of 51 reports received and that was with four caseworkers that's right and, and and so and I think we were looking at everybody was saying you got 51 cases filled 
and uh, you had four caseworkers. I think that's what I'm glad you clar clarified that. I like um, Mr. James's um, was concerned about the mental health issues, and he he talked about those a good good bit because certainly uh, a lot of homelessness is related to uh, mental health issues. Yeah. What are the uh, things that um, I wanted to ask you about? You get you help them get disability claims or do that now. From what I understand, um, approximately only 10% roughly of disability claims are approved the first time. I don't know. It, it's, it's very low. Um, what kinds of things do you do after that has been um, denied? The, um, the process that we go through is mm -hmm. um, after, if we, after our client is denied, they review the medical, the caseworker and, and the client review the medical evidence to see whether it's worth it to do um, a request for reconsideration. And if you do, and all of this is a time thing, so if you do a request for reconsideration and can provide some additional medical um, information that might sway the decision, that will be the next step. Once that's been done um, and they're denied for a second time, Generally speaking, we refer the client off to a lawyer mm -hmm. if they want to continue because we're not at that point when you get into the appeals process, our caseworkers don't have the time and nor the expertise mm -hmm. to deal with that. And, at and that that's point. what I was concerned about um, because with the high number of people that get um, denied that first time, um, many of them do have to seek um, legal redress legal to address, get yeah. some, some uh, help. Uh, on that so that's one of the that's why our goal is to improve our approval rate because if we can get our if we can if we can get our applications done to the degree that they are approved the first time out you know within four months that person has then it's settled we don't have to go through any of the other pieces sure. so again yeah. that's that's good one of the things I like is that um, bringing in that kind of money into the county and that means these people are getting food shelter all those kinds of things as well as raising their self-esteem mm -hmm. and with having some resources they're certainly going to feel better about themselves and that's going to to help out tremendously okay was there any more discussion on this i have one more question yes sir these people a lot of them they can't operate their business by themselves how many of them have a power of attorney? Do you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. I don't believe any of the people that we have worked with have any, I mean, they're their own power of attorney. But they're not capable, evidently, in many cases, not talking about a mean thing, but. I know what you mean. There's some, mentally, some of them probably should, but they don't. Um, and, no, and that's don't. the only way. I think that's one way that we can help them a great deal to have somebody there to help them. Because they, they, they really do need help. And let's yeah. face it, uh, it's terrible. Um, I was going to speak to that. Um, if they're in the hospital, usually since I wind up doing a good number of them, they, they do, and you probably see my reports, that um, they like capacity. And, and we say, that uh, me or one of my cohorts say that they do like capacity, then depending on the process, there's a legal process by which they would get a power of attorney. And in some instances, that may be a relative, a friend, or something like that. Or in some instances, the county may be uh, mm -hmm. come their guardian and become their power yes, of attorney. Yeah. And, and that helps out a good bit. So that's how that part is yeah. uh, taken care of. And, and, and um, we have, with probably half of the clients who've gotten um, approved, worked where we have a payee set up for those folks, which really helps a lot because then you know that their rent and utilities are going to get taken care Certainly. of. Certainly. Wow, <laughs> They're that's okay. Well, that's well. So sure. that, that has worked out very well. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank it's you very so much. informative. Going to move next to the uh, work first monitoring results. Thank you. Um, the results from our recent work first monitoring conducted by the state are in your 
board packet on pages 15 through 22 and also on page 60 at the very end you will see the report which shows overpayments uh, which resulted from this monitoring that was conducted. There's a lot of detail about the errors found and uh, uh, areas of deficiency that we need to work on in our performance improvement plan in your packet, but I'd just like to highlight the, the major results of the monitoring. The monitoring consisted of 10 work first family assistance cases, which is the eligibility um, component of work first, 10 work first employment services cases, which is the social work component of the Work First program, and three Work First services cases to low-income families who are at or below 200% of poverty. So 23 cases were reviewed. Six cases were found to have errors which resulted in a county responsible overpayment. In this program, overpayments are the responsibility of the county, uh, not the client. That differs from the Food and Nutrition Services Program. There's a federal mandate to collect any kind of overpayment in that program from the client. But in Work First, it is the county's responsibility. So the six cases that overpayments were found in, those are on your report and those are county responsibility. We received our preliminary results in the month of June and our final report last month in July. So we were already able to go ahead and work on correcting the cases that had errors. Most of them were corrected in June, some early in July. We've had uh, staff conferences with employees to go over areas that were found that need additional work. And we're including in our performance improvement plan the ongoing monitoring of those areas in addition to our routine monitoring to ensure that the errors found are not continuing errors in this program. We are scheduled for another monitoring uh, based on what we've just been told by the monitor that came recently in 2014. Counties of uh, Pitt County size are monitored routinely every other year and then the larger counties have an annual monitoring. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about uh, the report at this time. Yeah. Um, just in terms of how many work first uh, clients are there that we have? We have about, there were about a hundred who were involved in the work first employment services component and about 350 to 375 who are receiving, they receive a payment as a child only case. Like as an example, a family member might have custody of a child and the child receives work first. The hundred or so cases are cases that actually social workers are working with to try to help find employment in the community. Okay, is this a lot? What I was—I wasn't sure as in terms of the number of errors. Was this an unusual number of errors, or it compares to what we have received in the past? It's a lot mm -hmm. of the errors that are noted, the ones that are noted that are not county responsible overpayment, mm -hmm. are procedural errors which were incorrect but did not affect the client's receiving benefits or did not affect the outcome of the case. So there are areas we need to work on. The ones that do affect the outcome of the case are the county responsible overpayments for which the county is responsible. The clients did receive the benefits, but something was done in that an error was made that should have been done that is the reason the county is responsible for it. E because the, the benefit has already been received by the client. Okay. And for each case uh, in that um, last column, you have the monitor finding, and is that part of the performance improvement? Or is that there is a, there is, yeah, the monitoring finding. That's mm -hmm. the template which we use, mm -hmm. and at the end of that, we put, show when the date, uh, the date that the case was corrected, and we show what our ongoing action is going to be to ensure mm -hmm. that the errors do not continue. That's okay. correct. Uh, is there, um, in, not just for the individual cases, is there an overall plan that you have for monitoring these things so these errors do not occur in we the future? We do, correct. We, we will show as part of this plan that there is routine monitoring on a monthly basis of applications and reviews and that is done by the lead worker in the area of work first. Okay. 
And we will be uh, working on our work first unit as well as our Medicaid unit where we will have one unit responsible for taking and processing application and then the other unit will be responsible for doing the reviews. So we are in the process of making changes in how we do things in our work first and Medicaid okay. units which will delegate the responsibilities to one unit. We do the intake, they will take the applications and process it, then you have one unit that will be responsible for ongoing reviews. So the responsibilities will shift and the lead workers will be responsible for second party in the reviews and making sure that we follow in policy. When do you think that will come into play, Mr. Sarah? We're we're looking we're already doing some training with both sides with the work first workers and the Medicaid workers so we've already formed the units but they're still doing their program that they have the expertise in so as soon as we can get training then we'll start integrating aspects of each program with the workers in an intake processing unit and in the review unit we feel that if the since we have enough number wise with the two programs combined that if the workers can focus just on the applications intake and processing or just on the review we can get more efficiency with that and better accuracy since they're not trying to try to do both functions ballpark figure six months yeah. i would say no more than six months that we should have everything together is work first still a program that helps clients who own um, social service, receiving social service, work their way out of the process yes, into mainstream uh, everyday life. Yes. Then uh, in the educational process, <coughs> at what point are your clients receiving uh, how to handle funds, how to make decisions, and how to work their way. At what point? I'm familiar with them when they got near what they call it, short time. Right. They're gonna lose their benefit, they're gonna be shoved out anyway, and their benefits are gonna run out. I, right. I'm familiar with that part. But there should have been some educational process prior to that short term time. Yes, and so when, when is that? And, and, and I, I would just say, you know, that's a great question. And if you, if you could, if we could table that a little bit, because I think in the next month or so, we're going to come back to you because we're doing some reorganization with Work First, um, and would like to share that with you when we get finished with that reorganization, if that would be okay. I uh, that is a concern. Uh, uh, Oh, yes, I will wait. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm very much interested. In, you know, they've got this politics thing. That's one of the things. <laughs> that's, that's one of the things that's hot and hot issue right now. I mm -hmm. mean, very good. To, if we could, yeah. Sure. Very good. Now, I, I think my very point good. is along with Mary's. Um, uh, in, in a sense, um, how will it? How has it? And how will? Um, the vacancies, how have the va vacancies affected some of these errors that we have? In our work first family, in our work first family assistant unit, mm -hmm. we have one position that we gave up, but the vacancy did not have anything to do with this. This was more uh, centered around policy. Mm -hmm. When you look at the policy, you got a client that receiving assistance. It <clears> said <throat> that you have to have a health health check on the child and is that the requirement oh, okay. and if you don't have that requirement then the case is in there in error so it's more of following the policy making sure that you got the necessary <coughs> paper in the record so that these er not, or errors mm -hmm. so that this division is fully staffed mm -hmm. in terms of doing this kind of monitoring right. taking care of these things okay yeah. could, when you when you do that report could you do me a favor <coughs> and give me the actual counts uh, the cases, the number of clients, rather than just percentages. Um, um, you know what I'm sure. saying? Because, yeah. Yeah. because it sure uh, would, would be glad to. Yeah. yeah. That would help me to keep from asking certain. Okay, questions. we'll make sure we have the numbers as opposed to the percentage. You. 
No problem. And we definitely invite you at any time to come and walk through the process as a client would would experience that process um, with our agency. I'm very interested in because that, that certainly gives you perspective on you know what that's like, and certainly, <coughs> my, we we love suggestions, and you know comment on the things that we're doing. So I invite you any time. It would be great. Any other discussion? Okay. We're going to move on to the on-site uh, monitoring report. Um, this was the first time we've had this type of monitoring, and what she was looking at was the fiscal controls within the agency. And I'm really happy to say that we came out really well. The big thing was she wanted to verify that we um, had internal controls, which we do. Another issue they looked at was the single audit that the county goes through every year to see if we had any, any deficiencies within the single audit, which we did not. When I say we, I mean the whole Department of Social Services. We, we passed uh, the single audit through the fiscal type things. And then she spent a lot of time on um, the report that we turn into the state every year to get the revenues back into the county. We call it the 1571 report. She was looking to see that we were charging uh, staff time to the proper uh, coding for the service that they were providing. She made sure that uh, our general ledger, everything that we wrote checks for to pay bills to, that it balanced back to what we were asking the state to reimburse us for each, uh, each month. And all of that was correct, with the exception of we had two uh, issues that we had not bill completely to get the revenue back that we should have. The first one was we were paying $250 a month for a pro professional contract, and the manual used to say that you couldn't bill that to get reimbursed, and I did. I was not aware that the manual had been changed. So we now are, we can now bill for this uh, professional services, and we were able to go back and bill the whole year's worth, so, so we got that revenue back. Ha basically 50% of $250 for 12 months. And the other thing that uh, we had not done was we have what we call a cost allocation plan that is done by a company outside of the, the county every year, and they break down the cost. We call them 310, 311 costs, which are really operating costs that go across all of the, the county, all of the services that we provide. The 310 are general administrative type things, and the 311 is, can go to a program. Well, this past year when they did the cost allocation plan, they also broke out uh, 4D cost. It gave us a, a lump sum of money that we could bill so much for each month to get reimbursed for that, and we had not done that. We were billing the whole amount we were eligible to bill, but we were, were not billing the portion that was for 4D under 4D code. We were doing it under a different code, and so we weren't getting the, the full 67% back. So we were able to make that correction and we get that money back. It'll actually came in this, this, this month. So we didn't lose any money and we didn't have any errors and everything else that she looked at, if you'll look through it, you'll see, you'll see that there was no deficiencies throughout the whole thing, and um, I think they'll be doing this once a year, and every county will be going undergoing this this scrutiny each one time a year. From I, I, I'm assuming this is a sign of the times with uh, less money to go around, and this is the first it, time that it's being done. It probably has a lot to do with that. Now, the way we used to be monitored was, of course, we had the single audit, which audits the whole the whole county. But we also had what we called a local business liaison who would come in ever so often and look at our procedures and see what we were doing. But they were also the person that we called and asked questions if we had concerns on how to do something needed mm -hmm. to know. And they decided, I think the feds are the ones that made this decision, that it might not be so kosher for the people that was telling us how to do it also be the same people that come in and look at us so they uh, separate <laughs> so they separate <laughs> the duties and oh. so um, <clears throat> and the lady that's doing it she's she's worked in in the fiscal arena for many years so uh, I was real pleased with the audit or the monitoring as we call it, it wasn't really an audit okay. this time do we pay for this no it's it's the state the state, okay. state this does. person works for the state and they, they take care of it. Okay. any other okay Thank you very much. Don't go 
anywhere because I see you're up next uh, again. <laughs> uh, goals and objectives. Okay. Um, as you can see on my our goals, we had for the administrative that to spend 90% of the funding that we were allocated and to uh, get collections up to 86.60, no, excuse me, 95% was our annual goal for that. We did spend the 90% of the expenditure of the money that we had approved, but we only collected 86.60%. And part of the reason for that, not re reaching the 95% goal, is the way the state okay. sends our revenues back, <clears throat> which uh, we spend the money this month, but we don't get the money back until the next month. And so the last month of the year, the expenditures are in the counties this year's books, but the revenue for it comes back in this month. And we had didn't have it by the end of the fiscal year. So we basically, I think we did what was, we met our goal. It just, it doesn't show it here because of the way the money comes back. And the daycare stuff down in the bottom about um, monitoring the going to the providers each uh, year. We didn't meet our goal there of 24. And the reason we didn't meet the goal was because I had um, one of the ladies that actually does daycare, she broke her leg twice and was out of work for some time. And so trying to feel back feel to, to get daycare paid, <coughs> we just couldn't get out to the daycare centers to look at them. Um, and that's not really a state mandated thing. It was a goal that we just set among ourselves within in our agency. And the other, the last thing that we had was the number of audit compliance errors. I think that I'm, it, that looks like it might have an 11 down there. I'm not sure what that number is in that bottom what thing. What page are you on? I'm 29. on page 29, but I can tell you. Yeah, this is it. It's zero. I, I, I'm not sure what it looks, looks like. On your copy, it looks like it's got some little ones or something. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what it is, but it's zero. We had no, no audit errors uh, this year. Here, here's one that's printed out of the machine that you can't, that's mm -hmm. not, and it shows a zero. Oh. Because <laughs> it looks like an 11. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I, I saw that, I said, I wait a minute, it I can't like deal with that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. here you can see this one. That ha must have happened when we copied it on the copier and it didn't print through clear. But it really is a zero. We oh, had okay. absolutely no audit errors, findings this last audit. And the, the uh, single auditors will be back next week, I think it is, into the county auditing for, this, for, the, for the year that just finished. And, and you were saying some of the goals that you set are these state goals? We set them. You set them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any discussion on on this? Okay. Okay. I would like to highlight um, the medical assistance um, annual goals and targets. What page um, you That's on right? page thirty-five. Okay. All right. Um, for the processing of medical assistance to the disabled applications, we did not meet our annual goal for that particular program area. We uh, averaged 89% and the state requirement is 90%. In the uh, processing of all other Medicaid categories, we just did meet our goal. We averaged 90% for the 12 months. And to give an example, we average about a thousand applications in that area per month process. So even if we're meeting the state goal of 90%, that means that on an average 100 applications are passed due per month. That's the minimum requirement that the state requires. And uh, the staff have worked very hard to see that we meet the state goal uh, and, and are working toward meeting the state goal to get the applications approved timely, to get the medical assistance benefits to clients. And I will share with you that with the retirements we had as of the end of June, we have already seen an impact uh, for the month of July. We did not pass the report card. We lost some people at the end of June. And just that one month, we've already seen the impact that's had. That's why we're working as quickly as possible to get the positions filled, to try to build back so we can try to maintain 90% and do better than that. Uh, we did meet our processing um, 
standard for health choice applications for children at 93 percent and the state requirement is 90 percent so um, it's been a, it has been a struggle for the staff to be able to meet this standard and uh, my hat is off to all of them because because of them we've been able to do as well as we have and if they had not put forth the effort and worked as hard as they have we would not even be at this point given the vacancies that we have the other area I'd like to highlight is child support on page 37. <clears throat> um, our percentage of cases under order, our target for the year was 91%, and our, our um, annual percentage was 88.38%. We have had um, some vacancies in that area. There are three positions currently vacant, uh, two that have been vacant for four months, and one that was vacant for six months. And in that area, two of the employees were out on extended leave prior to those positions going vacant. So it's been even greater than six months on a couple of those positions. <clears throat> and uh, that has had an effect on our percentage, being able to have the level of percentage of cases under order that we would like to have. However, the staff worked very hard in the area of collections and collected a total of $14,200,658 for the fiscal year. And uh, we, we well exceeded our annual target uh, in that area. And the child support staff are, are to be commended for the efforts and, and how well they've done in collections for the year there. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Just then tell me how many cases there are. Well, I'll tell you, we have about 8,600 cases under order. Okay. Because when you say they're 84 percent, right, right. it doesn't tell me how many cases. I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm so sorry, basically, that's my weakness. so basically, mm -hmm. we need to look at a combination of percentages and, and absolutely. numbers. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Okay. absolutely. absolutely. Some like percentage, sorry, some like numbers. So, yeah. so we we'll can we'll see how we can sure. make it user friendly for everyone. Thank okay. you so very much. <laughs> I, I guess one of the things that I was uh, quite interested in as, as we on the board are concerned about is the effect of staffing on uh, meeting some of these goals. And, and you're saying it had a, a significant effect because you had people out on extended leave yes. and uh, those other things were um, not uh, full. And, right. and you saw it directly, especially with the um, um, retirement I think Peggy you brought up the fact that someone was also out so the staffing has had a significant impact on this I guess the next question is um, in terms of I think your person they're gonna they're lay they're She's gonna come, they, good and and with with the people that you were talking about that are out when do you think we'll have those people in position where they can start making an impact on bringing these numbers up to the uh, target well the two that were out on extended leave are retired so those are among the vacant positions here that we will be filling once uh, once the additional positions are released so there's something that we we have one of those in child support that we're working on right now that is unfrozen mm -hmm. so we're working toward we'll work toward getting those filled uh, but I mentioned the fact that they were on extended leave because the report shows the position was vacant for four or for six months, but that was at the point they actually retired. Uh -huh. So it meant that they, it was vacant they were going a lot longer. longer. That's correct. A longer time. In general, when do you think that these positions will be uh, filled and people trained? Well, in the child support area, um, we should be able to get the other one filled pretty soon. The one is already released and we've mm -hmm. received the applications for it. So once we wrap up with the ones that we're trying to finish up in in the food and nutrition services area and our outpost positions, that will be one in the group that it will be interviewed very soon. So one of them's released and then once the other two are released, we'll move on filling them. Uh, in the area of child support, um, sometimes we are able to hire people who already have child support experience but then sometimes there's interest by pe other people that work in the income maintenance division and that would be a promotion for somebody in income maintenance if they were interested in moving up to child support so uh, it just depends on who's selected whether we have inside interest and somebody's promoted or if somebody's hired from another child support agency 
Well, my hat's off to your staff as well as yours, Peggy, um, because you were talking about them really going above and beyond and they uh, have. with uh, people um, being out, and that's really good. So uh, that really is uh, very um, commendable. Um, what um, One of the things that um, I also liked, I think as the other uh, members liked, is the direct effect of vacancies on our performance. Uh, and, and that's very important. And I really encourage you to, to continue doing that because that's helping us a lot. Right. On child support, I know the Sheriff's Department, they play a big role. <clears throat> yeah. What you get. They so, do. I, that do you do they stay up on that to me probably that's it's as important a thing as anything you mean in serving papers yes yes, yes. They've, they've done a very uh, thorough job comprehensive job of serving papers and we so get good up, support from they're there. doing yes exactly. they are okay they that's are. all I wonder. and i think uh, that goes along with i guess we had a presentation right about last yeah. week yeah, last right week down. or so um in terms of what the uh Sheriff's Department was doing and, and those things. So. That's good. I think yeah. we need to let you know that. We appreciate yes. it. We do. Okay. Um, next, we're going to move on to the uh, daycare. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, we Margaret. Understand. I'm just going to, okay. as Brian did, point out a couple areas, and, and I know you're anxious to get in daycare. Um, yeah, yeah, a little mats Maybe. Up. <laughs> <laughs> but just want to point out, if you look on page 30, you know, I've presented to you our uh, participation with the state in uh, the REIT project, reaching excellence through accountability and practice. Through our um, achievement plan, there's two areas specifically that we're focusing on for improvement. One of those is placement stability, and if you look on page 30, um, the under um, children and families living in a safe and stable environment, the last three um, annual percent of foster care youth with two or fewer placements who are in care 12 months or less, and you can read the other two. Those are three outcomes we're focusing specifically on in terms of placement stability. That has a lot to do with recruitment of foster homes, knowing your population in care, and recruiting the appropriate placements for those children so that's an area that we are um, putting a lot of focus on we have seen some improvement in that area in the past year so I'm very pleased with that and if you'll turn the page the other area again big focus for us is annual percent of youth who achieve permanency through reunification within 12 months um, and the, again these are federal outcomes when you see that outcome so by the last quarter, we had uh, improved up to 47.37% from our 33.33%. And again, it's just not all about numbers. It's, these formulas are rather complicated, <laughs> to say the least, um, in how the state calculates these outcomes also. But we are seeing some great progress. In that same area, the, I wanted to point out to you, to the annual percent of uh, eight youth who have aged out who received a high school diploma or GED and enrolled in post-secondary education. Um, I, will, I am just so proud of the work that they have done in this what area, and 100%. Now? I'm page on the same page, page 31, mm -hmm. up at the top. Youth and children in DSS okay. custody living in a safe and permanent home. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Annual percent, um, it was a hundred percent. You can't do better than that. That was wonderful. How many children are we talking about? Um, we ended right now in care. We have eight, about eighty-eight children in care. But of course, kids have come and gone through the year. But ending the year, the kids that were um, the teens that we work with, uh, again, those that aged out of the program either received a high school diploma, a GED, or went to college. So I commend, you know, uh, our, especially our links program and our workers for putting such a focus on um, these outcomes for their kids. But you, but you know what I'm saying? You know how many they were. At, looking at this, I have the foggiest. We will work on getting. 
I will get you some numbers. I think also next month we are planning on, if you remember correctly, last year we did a written end of the year report. And I believe we are working on that right now and plan to give you that in next month at the board meeting. And that's where you're going to see your numbers associated with this. So, but we'll combine those two. <laughs> And we will work on when we do our goals and objectives for the upcoming fiscal year. I'm getting to take that some like percentages and some like the raw numbers. Well, some people openly admit their weaknesses, okay. and and uh, others can 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 see the crystal ball. So we will work on making sure that we have what necessary for you to evaluate what we're talking about. Thank you. I think when you have actual on important services and cases, it is more identifiable for most board people as to how many families, how many individuals. Yes, yes but I think one affected. of the reasons that we slid in this direction is because when we present numbers, they're one dimensional, and you go, but this doesn't tell us what your outcomes are. I think what she's asking And then for but I think both. a combination of both, mm -hmm. definitely. Both is what she's totally asking agree. For. So we will have Can't you read it better when you know how many yeah. families serve and how many children we're talking about? Say one hundred percent. Are you talking about five children? We will have both. So. Okay. I mean, you know. Fixing to get that. I think we're fixing to get that in both we ways. Can. Yeah, I think so. I think it's it's wonderful. wonderful. We can yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess um yeah. again, um the the same question in terms of the, the staffing and um, just looking at the goals that you've made and goal as well as goals that you you missed. How did staffing affect uh, reaching these goals? Yes. Did what kinds of things I, I think you've talked some about how you're looking at reaching these goals and will that be in your yes. um, end of the end of the year? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm really <laughs> glad about the uh, kids that are getting their degrees in post-secondary education. Okay. All right, now we're going to go to the um, director's report. Oh, we got, uh, Ms. Dixon got one thing about daycare. Oh, yeah. And that was included on your back page. It was not attached to your this packet, but it was included in your... Uh, I was going to finish in the, in, with the, this report, um, if, and if you look on page 32, I um, wanted to, you to see um, under the uh, objective of annual percent of subsidized funding, we at the end of the year uh, spent 100 percent of our uh, allocation. And I wanted to also just point out to you, because you won't hear this report anymore, if you remember our Homeless Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program, that has ended. Our three years was up, will be, is up this month, but our money is, we spent out July, so that million dollar grant is gone. 85%, um, and I will get the number of families for you next month. <laughs> <laughs> are um, stably housed as a result of help from that program. Um, in front of you, there's a sheet called subsidized child care. You put it in front of you at the board meeting. I, this is just, I want it just to give you some information at this point um, where our program stands. As Mr. Perry said, the you will see attached to your board package is the uh, Pitt County waiting list policy okay this policy is it talks about our waiting list um we have implemented a waiting list to limit and or reduce subsidy service whenever the following occurs available funding for subsidy services will not meet the demand of services available funding for staff to administer the program is not sufficient or the number of available child care slots is insufficient to meet the demand for services. <clears throat> if you look at the sheet I gave you, you can see what the funding was for 2011-12. $7,656,266. Let's get thrown off when I get up into the millions. <laughs> 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 Even the hundred. <laughs> Um, 
That was our allocation between regular subsidy and Smart Start funding last year. Uh, as I told you a minute ago, 100% of those funds were utilized. We spent great effort putting children on to utilize and get out to families the amount of money that was allocated to our county. And I think we did a great job with that. Um, we ended the year with 1,954 children in, in care and end of the year for uh, subsidy is May. June comes out of this year's allocation. Um, back in, we really started after the first of the year putting, uh, taking kids off the waiting list. When we started in January, we had 1,412 on the waiting list. As of the end of May, we had 923. However, this brings us into the year on the high side for the first quarter with the number of children. And as you can see from our funding for this year, we, our allocation is reduced by $213,206, okay? Just want to share with you and bring this to your attention today because we're looking at several strategies, looking at our data, looking at some of the options that we have um, to reduce our spending over this next year. Um, one of the things, of course, is we have kids that naturally go off every month. Typically, that can be between 25 and 40. I would say an average is more like 30. Um, our expenditures are high for July because all of our after-school children are full-time care. Okay, but they will be returning to school. Uh, some may continue to use after-school care, some may not. We also have 242 children who will be starting kindergarten. Some will use after-school care and some will not. Um, we also looked at, as you know, I think in 2008 we came to you with a, with a similar funding issue and we decided to reduce the age limit from 13 to 10 years old, and 10 years became the limit we wouldn't pay for after school care past that because after school care, children have other options, after school programs, community programs, etc. We're looking at the number of children in that age category. We have 22 that right now that will turn age 10 between now and the end of the year, 50 in the age nine, and 73 eight-year-olds. <coughs> Again, just looking at the numbers. We also need the numbers of children that will go to pre-K programs and out of our expenditures. So there's a lot to look at between now and September. Just wanting you to know that we are looking at it all. Some, some of the things that can increase our spending is that some centers get star increases, and you all know what those are. Some of you may not, but we'll tell you. <laughs> um, so there's lots of things to look at. Just want you to be aware that we're looking at them, and we may come back to you in the next <coughs> month with a plan to reduce our spending. Um, as you can see from the policy, um, you know, what our priority groups are for child care, the recommendation on the policies that we go um, when we have to do a reduction in services. Um, Pitt County may end services to families in reverse order of the priorities being with the lowest priority group first, meaning the education and training, developmental needs, employment, etc., from the bottom up, and that's on your sheet. So just wanting you to be aware, that's all. Okay. Okay. Now we can, uh, thank you very much. Very helpful. This is interesting, um, the effect of of the budget on daycare, and I appreciate the fact that you're looking at a, a way to compensate for the lost income. Okay. And now we're going to go to the uh, director's report. In the director's report, you have the NC FAST update. We are scheduled to go live September the 17th, I think. And what that means that between starting August the 20th, our food and nutrition service staff will start training on this new program, NC Pass, how to use the program. We are anticipating that 
it will increase the amount of time that our staff will need to take applications and to process our applications. So we will have information posted in our lobbies to make our clients aware that there will be a longer time to process and to take your application because it's involved our staff learning a new program, being able to key all that information into this new system and then to process those cases. So where you were able to bring the information in today, if you waited till the last minute to bring in the information that you need to process your case, then our staff was able to go in and go ahead and process that case. But beginning in September, that would not be the norm because our staff would be learning a new system of how to input information. All that information will have to be put in from scratch. So if staff, if clients wait to the last minute to return information, then it would be a delay in getting that, getting their benefits to them. Uh, they will have a longer wait when they come in to make an application because everything will have to be rekeyed into this new system. So it's like coming in, starting from scratch, starting the whole application process over, starting your whole read term over. What we are doing now, our staff are working on overtime and working on the weekend to make sure that all the application that they have, all the reader terms, that they have all this information is keyed into the system. So when we go live, we want to make sure that we have nothing backlog that will impede the clients getting the services that they want. But we want clients to know that beginning in September, when we go live, that there will be a delay in getting your information and a delay in processing the case. You will have a longer wait when you come in to make application because it's a new system that everyone is learning. So you might hear clients complaining. How visible will the sheriff's department be? We have a deputy <laughs> in the building, and we have deputies but he upstairs. Needs to be visible well, he's visible, here. and then we have deputies upstairs Austin. away. So, how much time, Mr. Perry? We're looking at from 30 to 45 minutes to uh, t take our application. That's the best you can do. It's the best you can do. Yeah, but we yes, want people is. to be aware. You know, people get upset. Yeah, get. <laughs> When they have come in, they have to wait longer than they think they should have to wait. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you wait till the last minute to bring in your information, and then you're calling the next day because your case is not processed, and you're saying that your family do not have food, and what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now just kind of, I recollect you've been talking about this yeah. process for a while, and, and, uh, and um, that's very good mm -hmm. because I think we're letting the people know what kinds mm -hmm. of things are going on. It also shows some planning that you were doing uh, with this program because you had seen this um, coming before. Mm -hmm. So I, I really think that was a very good step to, to be prepared and, and to let people know that um, there may be a little bit of delay. How else could they speed their application uh, process? They could speak once we allow teleclient flight information that mm -hmm. they need. If they go ahead and bring that information in and not wait till the last day, and and the last day would usually be, be it's be the thirtieth day of, of the, the month. date that you need to bring. So in. so if they get the information in quicker, they, um, we can it work it work. faster. Yeah, and before yeah. it wasn't uh, as big of an issue, but now it's going to be more. It of will an be issue. an issue okay. because everything has to be keyed okay. over. It's starting new. Oh, okay. Well, and our next board meeting would be on September the 11th as opposed to September the 10th. So we'll meet on Tuesday as opposed to Monday because the commissioners meet on that Monday. We got it right this time. <laughs> yes. I just check the minutes and make sure it's correct in the minutes. Something. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Let's move on with the agenda. <laughs> Let's move on with the um, agenda. At this time, at this time, uh, see, do you need to read that first, or yeah. do we make, need to make a motion first? I need to read it first. Okay. Okay. North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11 regarding closed sessions. Section A, permitted purposes, is the policy of the state that closed sessions shall be held only when required to permit a public body to act in the public interest as permitted in this section. 
A public body may hold a closed session and exclude the public only when a closed session is required. Also, item number one, to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential pursuant to the law of this state or of the United States or not considered a public record within the meaning of Chapter 132 of the General Statutes. Mr. Chairman, I move that we go ahead and close that. Second. Okay. Motion has been made to go into a closed session. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. <clears throat> Miss, 